Crack Course Shaping the way we teach English Webinar Wednesday Welcome to the Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course 14, brought to you by the American English team. My name is Jennifer Hodgson, part of the American English team based in Washington, D.C. Welcome teachers from all around the world. This afternoon, I've seen teachers from Mexico, Nicaragua, Russia, Niger, teachers from so many countries around the world. So it's great that even though we're in many different countries, we're able to connect, at least virtually, and support each other as a community of teachers. Here you can see the Course 14 schedule, with today's webinar being the third webinar of Course 14, with three more topics after today to look forward to. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. And the way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as you are already doing. This is where you can ask questions or make comments related to, to today's topic. Of course, not every question will be answered during the session, as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there are other ways for you to ask questions after the session that I will show you in just a few minutes. Your presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These are multiple choice questions that will appear on the screen for you to answer. You will see myself, moderator Jenny, and moderator Heather in the chat box to assist you. We know some people may experience technical problems. However, we cannot fix individual technical issues. But we will let you know if there's a global problem. If you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod that you see at the bottom of the screen. Webinar courses consist of six webinars. And during the course, webinars take place every other Wednesday, as we like to call Webinar Wednesday. Participants who attend at least four out of six of the webinars receive a certificate from their regional English language officer or local U.S. Embassy. To ensure you are eligible for the certificate, we will ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. So please do not submit it before we request it or it won't be counted. For individuals, we only need your email address at the very end. And for viewing hosts, meaning you are watching this webinar with a group of teachers in the same room, then we need your email address and the number of participants in your group. We hope that many of you are already familiar with our Ning site, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join this site. Um, you must first register to join the site, and then your membership should be approved within 24 to 48 hours. On the Ning, you can find discussions related to each topic. So we hope that you've already participated in today's discussion with your presenters. You will also find readings and resources before each webinar. And then after the webinar, you'll find the recording and the PowerPoint. If you have any remaining questions after the webinar, this is a great place to ask questions. And finally, the American English team has a lot of additional resources that are great for teachers of English. So raise your hand if you've ever heard of Activate, Games for Learning American English. Activate is a compilation of games that are easy and fun to use in the English classroom. They are all free and downloadable on our website. So welcome again to today's webinar, brought to you by the American English team. I'm very excited to introduce our session entitled, Strange Weather, Climate Change Activities for the English Classroom. One of the most pressing issues in our world is global warming, or climate change. 
Is it happening? How fast? And what can we do? Our presenters believe the first step towards solving a problem is knowing that there is a problem. This webinar will review key themes related to climate change and the environment, and will provide a thought, relevant, thought-provoking activities and materials that teachers can easily use in their English classes. Today, we are lucky to have our presenters joining us from two different locations in Eastern Europe. I'm happy to welcome Kevin McCoy and Eve Smith. Kevin is the Regional English Language Officer in Ukraine and is a frequent presenter in the Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course. He's concerned about the environment and thinks that English class provides a great opportunity to increase awareness on the subject. Kevin plays music and likes to create audios for language learning too. Eve is serving as a Senior English Language Fellow in Georgia for the 2014-2015 school year. She is an avid scuba diver, and she introduces environmental education elements in her EFL lessons in response to the vis visible impact pollution has had on the ocean over the last decade. This is her first webinar, and she is excited to participate. So welcome, Kevin and Eve. Thank you, moderator Jenny and the American English team in Washington, D.C. Strange weather, strange weather, strange weather. Can anyone see where this picture is? Do you know where this picture was taken? That's a little bit of strange weather that uh, I encountered in, yes, Victor, from Nicaragua, Washington, D.C. That's the Washington Monument. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kevin McCoy. I'm the Regional English Language Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. My co-presenter and partner today is our Senior English Language Fellow and a Specialist in Teaching from Tbilisi, Georgia, Eve Smith. We're awfully glad to have you here. Our goals tonight are pretty simple. We want to increase awareness about climate change in, I hope, a very easy to understand way. And then Eve and I would like to provide activities and resources that you can use for these awareness activities in your classroom. Many of the activities we will provide today are from American English at state.gov. So they are free for you. So you've heard the terms global warming and climate change. How are they different? Is it really happening? Well, in our pre-webinar polls, most of you said, yes, you believe it is really happening. And that's good, because if you believe it, you are likely to spread the word to your students. I'm going to give now an overview of what climate change and global warming are. This is just background. I'll try to keep it simple. But don't worry. It's just background knowledge. So it all starts with the atmosphere. Earth wears an atmosphere around it. It's actually made of gases. The sun's energy comes into the Earth's atmosphere, and some of it stays there. By the way, all these pictures, which are really good for classrooms, can be found on two websites. One is from NASA the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The others from the Environmental Protection Agency. And of course, we have these links for you on the name. You've probably heard this term, the greenhouse effect. A greenhouse takes hold of the sun's heat, right, and keeps some of it inside. 
So while it can be cold outside, plants that need warmth can actually grow inside. The Earth's atmosphere is not made of glass. It's made of gases. But the function is similar. They hold in heat. Where there's no atmosphere, the heat goes right out into outer space. See this guy? He's wearing his winter clothes because it's very cold um, in outer space. Uh, Raya from Amman said, kids, kids love this topic. That's great to hear that children will like this topic. Great. So gases in our atmosphere are natural, but there are also some that are man-made. And you can see in this picture where those gases often come from. They come from factories, power stations, forest fires, cars. Did you know that we have one billion cars in the world? I'd like to see a parking lot that holds one billion cars. In the United States, we can see where these gases or emissions, emissions are produced um, by a factory and sent into the air. And it all comes from the production of power mostly, right? Electricity, industry, uh, transportation. And this is where we get into a problem. When man-made pollution thickens the atmosphere with these bad gases like carbon dioxide, more of the sun's energy is trapped inside. It's like making your sweater thicker. It traps more heat inside. This results in warming the whole planet. Yes, Raya from Amman says, we should tell our kids, uh-huh, I agree with you. It's important to create awareness as early as possible. Here are two planets in our solar system. Venus is closer to the sun. It has a constant cloud covering, so it traps a lot of gases. That makes Venus, for one thing, a very hot planet where nothing can survive. It's 482 degrees Celsius. Mars, on the other hand, doesn't have the capability to trap as many gases. It's 55 degrees below zero. However, ah, nice and cozy, just right in the middle, is the Earth. The Earth atmosphere holds the air we breathe, and it makes our climate moderate compared to other climates. Now, why is it important if our temperature is rising? Well, you'll see that the climate, everything on the Earth, is connected. For example, rising sea levels or melting snow and ice can lead to rising sea level. Warmer oceans can lead to stronger storms. Changing conditions for plants and animals. So that means as the temperature rises, the patterns for animals where they live and migrate can change. One example if more of the earth is warm, mosquitoes can spread their range. Raise your hand if you love mosquitoes. OK, so we do have some mosquito lovers. <laughs> OK, that's just one example of how everything is interconnected. 
<laughs> Lida in Nicaragua says, hate mosquito bites. I'm sure you're not the only one, Lida. This picture shows some of the changes that are caused by global rising of temperatures. You can see changing rain and snow patterns. You can see changes in animal migration. You can see less snow and ice. What else can you see in this picture? What's happening here? That's right, fire. What's happening here and here and here? Well, I'll give you the answers. So we see rising sea levels, warmer oceans, changes in plant life cycles, higher temperatures, more heat waves, lots of different things are happening. But let's distinguish now between climate and weather. Mark Twain said this about them. I'm going to give you the two answers for the gap, Phil because you're teachers and you love exercises. So what do you think? Climate is what we expect, and weather is what we get. So when we go to a warm place, we expect it to be warm and sunny on our vacation. If it rains, that's what we get. In other words, climate is the big picture. It is long term. Weather is what is happening now. It is short term. We measure climate over hundreds of years. So what has happened since 1800 with our climate? Hmm. Let's take a test because teachers also love tests. Take a moment to read these. Okay, most of you are doing very well. Um, Okay, great. Let's move on, and I will tell you the answers here. And you can mark yourself to see if you got it correct. The Earth's average temperature has increased since the late 1800s. Can anyone tell me what happened at the beginning of the 1800s? It's a little period of time we like to call the Industrial Revolution. Thank you, Lida from Nicaragua, followed by Valeria from, um, and Sander from Bahrain. Yeah. So we began burning a lot of coal, but, sorry, coal, oil, and natural gas. So yes, the average temperature of the planet has increased. Only a tiny bit, but that upsets the delicate balance. 2000 to 2010 was the warmest decade ever recorded. Yes, that's true. So things are getting warmer. <laughs> Thank you, Bessie from Honduras. That's a very nice... Students would forget they're in class with a presentation like this. I hope so. Global warming affects the ocean. 
You know, that is also true. Our oceans are such a good friend to us. For the last 200 years, they have been absorbing about half the bad gases that our industry has put into the atmosphere. But guess what? Now the oceans are suffering because those gases are affecting the chemical balance in the ocean. So, for example, corals are having a difficult time surviving. Some fish, migration patterns are changed. Now, this one is up to you. True or false? It's your opinion. Most of you said yes in recent years. You have noticed strange weather in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. All right, so if this is all true, climate change, uh-huh, so what can I do about it? I'm just one person. And why teach this in English class? You know, those are excellent questions. And I've got a simple answer for you. What you can do about it is take little steps. And we're going to show you some of them to be more ecologically responsible. And also, you can teach this in class because it's a vital issue for us. An English class always needs themes, right? If our students learn this, whether they are 10 years old or 20 or 50, it's a great way to spread the word. Change is going to happen through governments eventually. But in order for governments to listen, we are going to have to spread the news. The public is going to have to have their say. But one thing we can do is reduce your carbon footprint. And this is a very common term nowadays. That's why it's here in our webinar. What does it mean? Carbon footprint is the measure of your personal or an organization's total of emissions. That is, what do you do to contribute negatively to global warming? So, for example, if you burn forests, and I hope you don't do that, you have a large carbon footprint, probably. If you drive a car all the time, you have a larger carbon footprint. If you walk and turn off your lights, turn off the electricity, if you do all these things, you have a smaller carbon footprint. And that's what we want to shoot for. That's our goal, a very small carbon footprint. And I think that's something it's very worthwhile to teach our students. Uh, Pablo from Brazil says, I don't even have a car. Well, Pablo, you're reducing your carbon footprint. I don't have a car either. I like walking. I like walking so much that I even created a little song about it. And this song is available for you to download at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. And we're going to play it right now. And as we play it, I'd like you to think, hmm, how could I use this in my class? What activity could I do with this class? One, two, three, four. Forget the car. Forget the car. We're not going far. We're not going far. We like walking. We sure do. Walking, walking, walking. 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 It's good for you. Walking, 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 walking. It's good for you. Doesn't cost a thing. Doesn't cost a thing. Walking, walking, walking. 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 walking.
Hey, Galina from Moldova said, it's like chanting. Okay, so how would you use this in your class? Students can take them as instructions. Uh huh. Grammar chant, okay. How do you use a grammar chant? Miming, thanks, Yana. Students could mime, actually they could walk. You could choreograph so that they are doing actions to the song. Mm-hmm. Commands, sure. All right. You could have students write the words down as a sort of dictation. Right? You could, as Zarema from Uzbekistan says, fill in gaps. You could write some of the words on, a bo on the board and have students fill in the gaps. Phuket says also have them create their own songs. Good idea. We're going to do that, actually, after Eve Smith talks to us. Okay, so some good suggestions there. And now you've had time to read some of the other little things that you can do to be more ecologically responsible and reduce your carbon footprint. And my partner, Eve Smith, is going to give you more great ideas for uh, resources and project work that you can do both inside and out of class. So, we're going to go from Kiev to Tbilisi, Georgia, turning it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. In this section, I will be discussing project ideas and resources with you. After this section, Kevin will introduce some shorter activities that you can do in the classroom immediately. I'd like us to start with the question, what did you do to save the world today? One of the comments that I saw from um, Gilberto in Mexico is the first thing to do is realize that we have the power to change things. This was the same idea that I had in my mind when I saw this graffiti on the building in Tbilisi. I loved it because it made me stop and think, Hmm, what have I done to save the world today? And so I, I sat down and I listed out, okay, I used a reusable water container whenever I was outside the house. I brought my own bag to the grocery store so I didn't use plastic. And I made sure that I unplugged my cell phone charger whenever I left the house. So I see that many of you are adding comments about what you did. And it's wonderful. So you didn't waste water. You cleaned the classroom. You reused your plastic bags. You didn't smoke. Great. You reused um, paper sheets. You rode your bike. You planted trees. That, these are all excellent things. So as we continue, throughout this webinar and throughout our day. Let's just take time to think about how are we being in the world and what could we do to do our part to save it. Some general topics that we can work with on this idea of um, saving the environment and discussing the carbon footprint, um, shark finning, plastic, growing our own food, deforestation, and severe weather are all different wonderful topics that we can discuss with our students. So as an avid scuba diver, I like to focus on shark appreciation because 100 million sharks are killed every year for things like medicine and shark fin soup. Shark finning which is the second topic from the top on our list, is horrible 
because the fins of the shark are cut off and the shark, still alive, is dropped back into the ocean to die. Sharks are very important for us because they are the honeybees of the sea. If they die out, we too will eventually die out. Another topic on this list is deforestation. And that means the cutting down of trees through logging. Many of you mentioned on things that you do to save the world today, planting trees. That's a great way for us to combat logging as it takes place in the world, because the trees are our lungs. So there are so many wonderful topics to talk about with the students. We are going to talk about today plastic, because plastic is something that is related to all of us in our day-to-day -day lives, and it's something that we can control. Um, LMA and Lita, LMA from Mexico, Lita from Nicaragua, already mentioned that there are too many plastic bags in, um, in our world. So one way that we can introduce plastic to our students is through projects. We can have students create their own comics for the community that they either post around, they can put the comics in a local newspaper, or they can place the comics online. They could write a petition. So Martha from Nicaragua mentioned earlier that companies don't care. Well, let's make them care about what's going on in the world by creating a petition where you identify an area that you want to be changed, and you gather a ton of signatures, and then you give that to the company to make sure that they understand that you are demanding these changes. Other things that we can do are posters about the impact of plastic, a radio program, a YouTube video documentary, a public service announcement. And so today, we're going to focus on public service announcements. You'll notice from the list that it's a high-tech list. Don't worry if you don't have ac access to the technology. We will also give you other resources that you can use if you don't have access to this technology. So a public service announcement can appear as a television advertisement, a radio advertisement, a poster, a pamphlet, a web page, a Facebook page, t-shirt, a blog. There are many different ways that we can show public service announcements. Announcements, excuse me. What I'm going to focus on today is sharing a public service announcement with you that can be found on the Marine Debris blog. This public service announcement was created by Jim Toomey. Some of you may remember him if you were able to watch the pre-video on Sherman the Shark. He is our cartoon drawer for Sherman the Shark. And he did this wonderful video for the Marine Debris blog. This blog has a lot of really interesting links to resources that others are doing to combat trash and debris that are in our ocean. This short public, uh, um, public service announcement video is called Two Minutes on Ocean. It starts with just an image of a garbage can. The garbage can is important because we all have trash. We all need to do something with the trash. And then he shows us that normally when we throw our trash out, elements go to be recycled. We have areas for plastic, for paper, and for aluminum. Sometimes, though, the trash isn't recycled. And an example is this. Um, picture of a ship where it's just throwing it overboard and then it sinks to the bottom where eventually all of the trash 
will escape onto the ocean floor when the bag breaks apart. Other problems is sometimes we miss the garbage can and our trash falls around the garbage can. When it rains, what happens is our little trash, our little bottle, is washed into the gutter, and from the gutter, it can go into the stream or into the river, and eventually, it will find its way into a larger body of water. One of the big concerns that we have now is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. You can see that in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, all of the trash coming from all of the continents and countries that you can see, it all makes its way to one location where it just stays there. And eventually, um, some of it will biodegrade, and then the fish will eat it. Um, and this can cause problems for the fish and for us. Another location this trash appears is on beaches. Sometimes you can go to a beach where there are very few other humans and you'll see trash. So I agree with Martha from Nicaragua. We really need to stop and we really need to educate ourselves on how to combat this trash. And Jim Toomey tells us that these are the top 10 items that are removed from the global coastlines and waterways. You can see number one is cigarette butts. So not only is it great to stop smoking for our own health and for the health of those around us, but these cigarette butts end up in the stomachs of um, seabirds, sea fowl because they believe it's something they can eat, and then they die from this. You'll see that number two are, is plastic bags. Then we have number five, um, plastic bottles. So one of the solutions that Jim Toomey gives us for this problem is to ask the people who are producing the products that we buy, the industries, to make our products smaller. Instead of having individual washing packets, which as you can see is double the size, we could have instead wash concentrate. It's the same amount, but it's a lot less trash when produced. Also, as many, many of you already mentioned, instead of doing plastic, we can do recyclable elements to hold our water, hold our food, and um, hold our bags. And I definitely agree with Chi Hao from Niger that education is the best way to awaken the consciousness of the people. The elements of a public service announcement. So I like to do these public service announcements with my students because it gets them to practice their knowledge of the issues. And the elements of it are that you have 10 to 60 seconds for the public service announcement itself. They have to answer who, what, where, when, how, and why. It also has to be persuasive. So they are practicing the language of persuasion. And then there has to be a problem and a solution. So can you write in the chat box for me, what were the problems that Jim Tooney, Tooney, excuse me, identified, and what were his solutions? Ooh, that's very nice to see that in um, Cote d'Ivoire, there's a law against plastic bags. OK, so in Jim Toomey's public service announcement, it is reduce the use of plastic bags. That's absolutely right. And his solution, his solution was to use reusable bags. One of the other issues that he mentioned was um, extra waste. And the problem was that we had 
too much extra packaging. So he encouraged the solution to that. He encouraged us to um, reduce the size of the packaging. Another way to show a, um, a public service announcement is by a poster. So you can see here some of Kevin's students created a poster about coral and how important coral is. You can see that they said why corals die. So they gave a list of some of the different reasons. They also gave some facts about corals. And then they said um, why corals need protection as well. And then finally, what, they, what you can do. OK. So in the chat box, what are the language skills that can be developed through a public service announcement? For example, speaking. Another example would be the usage of mental verbs such as I like or I think. What are, reading is another one. Writing, thank you. Um, Victor, Nicaragua, and Elizabeth, Russia. It's nice for different learning styles. I agree. Vocabulary, grammar. OK, and also to show the problem that we have. It works on analysis, listening, personal opinion, expressing opinions, critical thinking, passive voice. Absolutely. Wonderful. So you can see that public service announcements are uh, one way to practice all of those wonderful skills with our students. Some might wonder um, how long a project would take. For example, a public service announcement, you have to introduce the topic. You have to have a little bit of research for the students um, on the topic. And from my experience, it can take anywhere from two weeks to two months, depending on how quickly you want to move through the project and um, what you would like to do with it. Thank you again for your shares. Another activity that I'd like to introduce to you is the photo essay. You have probably heard of this before, but a photo essay is a series or set of photos gathered or taken to tell a story or provoke emotion. It contains elements of the written story. So here I've created a photo essay for you. In the chat box, could you tell me what you think the story is about? Snow, yes. <laughs> a ski trip. OK, Happy New Year. A winter vacation. Learning how to ski, that's definitely a possibility. Living in the forest. Holidays on the snow. So the story is that I am skiing from um, where I, where I the, the start point to my house um, to celebrate New Year's. It's also a metaphor for the journey that we have, you know, from one year into the next. We're making a change. Um, and we are trying to activate ourselves in some way to make that change, right? So that's an example of a, um, a photo essay. Other ways to use photo essays in the classroom, you can begin introducing a photo essay by asking the students, what do they see? So if you are also to look around the classroom or wherever you are and you just look at, I, you know, I can see a printer, I can see this, I can see that, this helps them to be aware of what's in their environment and the things that they might like to take photos of. The reason that we want them to be aware of their environment is because a photo essay is community-based. This means that they go out into their community and they look around for areas where they can make improvements. Maybe they are finding garbage in the street, so they take pictures of where they find it, and then they decide, do they want to clean it up and take pictures of also the cleaning process? 
And that becomes the story of cleaning up the street that is community-based. This is also, from the same example, you can see experience-based, because the students themselves are the ones with the cameras um, going out into their communities and Sorry, going out into their communities and making sure that they, they are connecting with their community and with their experience. And as the research shows, we know that when students find something meaningful, they are more likely to connect with the language that they practiced during that time that it was meaningful. So here we have um, Pinterest. Is anyone familiar with Pinterest? If you want to let me know, yes, I can see, yes, no, yes, no, okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with Pinterest, Pinterest is a, a, a website where you can capture pictures and put them online. You can see here that I created a Pinterest um, drawing, not, I'm sorry, not drawing, web page where it says the ocean, the sea, and me. This is the same title that I gave the handout that you can find on Ning. So when you create Pinterest, a page on Pinterest, it is about um, whatever you feel passionate about. And what I did is I took quotes that were about the sea and about the ocean that I felt inspired by. I listed these same quotes on the handout that you can download from the, ocean, um, from the Ning website, also called The Ocean, The Sea, and Me. So I uploaded photos in, of different sections of the ocean or lakes or waterways that I saw, and I tried to match the same feeling of the photo with the feeling of the quote. So you can see the one where you see me, it's in salt it's in a it's at a salt lake in Turkey and it says we carry oceans inside of us in our blood and our sweat and we are crying the oceans in our tears so this is one way that you can have the students connect the photo and the meaning with a quotation that you're studying in class Another example of this where I have created more um, photos for more images is here. You can see some of the same images from the last one, but I've added a few more. And again, the idea is to have the feeling of um, the Earth and of the amazing things that we have on our Earth. Okay, here's also another image from Pinterest which is of different aquatic life that I really enjoy looking at. So I think that this is very easy for students to use. Many of them are already on Pinterest. The nice thing about it is even if you don't have a, an iPhone or an Android, you can still do this on the computer. I did all of what you've just seen on the computer. So I encourage you to uh, check it out and to see if um, you like it and how you might also use it in the class. Please remember that you, if you download the handout, you can find a whole bunch of different quotes that are related to the ocean and the sea that you might be able to use in class. Or if you alter them slightly, um, you may be able to use them maybe with uh, learners that are not as advanced. So another way, another type of activity is a cartoon that we can do. One of the wonderful things about a cartoon is that they are self-contained stories. This means that they don't have to be very long, but they, tell, they have a beginning, they have a middle, and they have an end. They can include adventure, they can include fun, and they can practice grammar and vocabulary. So I created this cartoon. This is Leroy the Lemon Shark. 
He is a pessimist because he is a lemon shark. And for me, I was thinking that lemons, they're a little bit sour. So I put that with um, being a pessimist. And for him, it's that he thinks the glass is always half empty. In our chat box, can anyone tell me what the glass is always half empty means? Why lemon? He is called a lemon shark because actually in real life, his eyes are yellow. And he's different from different sharks. Never has enough. He never has enough. Great. Yeah, that's a great way to uh, that's a great way to describe a glass is always half empty. Never having enough. And the opposite, as I can see, some of you are saying, is that um, the glass can be half full. So don't worry, Graciela, about it being not ne a negative message because I'm trying to add characters together that. Um, complement each other. And so there would be more characters, not only a negative image, but also some positive images as well, um, to add some excitement to the characters and their interactions in the cartoon itself. Octavius the octopus is also another creature that, um, or cartoon creature that I created, and he has a very big head. So one of the things that I was thinking is that because he has such a big head, he might believe that he's amazing and brilliant. Um, and he always starts sentences with, have I told you about the time? And so he goes into a long story about something that he's done. So he and Leroy the Lemon Shark are friends, and they have a lot of different adventures together. For example, Leroy the Lemon Shark also likes to scuba dive, and together with Octavius the Octopus, they go to scuba dive into the very deep, deep ocean to find the giant squid. Okay, this is an example of a cartoon that was created by some of stu um, Kevin's students, and this one is about smoking factories and then being very dangerous for our environment. So you can see that you can use these with all levels of learners. Um, the nice thing is because they are drawing pictures. Um, uh, more information about this can be found from the TED Talk, Learning from Sherman the Shark, with Jim Toomey. He gives a great explanation of how to create cartoons and how to do more with them. So if you are interested in using cartoons in your own class, you might join us November 5th for using comics in the EFL classroom with James Whitting. So I'd like to finish up by introducing um, a couple of resources to you for this um, topic. This is Free Spirit Publishing, a Kid's guide, guide to Climate Change and Global Warming. What I like about this is it's a PDF that you can download. And the nice thing about this PDF is it actually talks you through some of the different topics that we've mentioned. This is a sample um, or a screen capture from the PDF itself. So stage one of a project is investigation. Stage two is preparation. And so this project that they're having the students do is uh, talking about the problem of having drought, a which is a severe dry spell. And um, they're encouraging the students to actually look at how the school can conserve water. And so there's an area, as you can see, one, two, three, where the students brainstorm different ways that they can conserve water. And then they can continue on to stage three, which is action. And 
what's wonderful about this is it encourages the students to make an action plan of how are they going to either create a public service announcement or get the word out about whatever pro, um, process they are or problem they are facing. So this, again, can be easily downloaded for free from the, um, the website. Also on this website are some, or also in this PDF, in this free book, um, there's other activities. For example, where in the world is global warming, where they give you some general ideas of what occurred recently that has been scientifically proven in our world. And then they ask you and the students, mainly the students, to do some research and fill in some other areas uh, that they are aware of where there are issues with global warming in the world. Okay, so before I turn everything back over to Kevin for some more fun activities, I just wanted to give you some resources. They are primarily resources for scuba divers. But just, you know, you're thinking to yourself probably, Eve, why are you giving me resources for scuba divers? But the wonderful thing about these resources is they are very specific. They provide a lot of pictures. And they give you a lot of information. So if you wanted to do anything on the coral reef in class, you can take them to the site reef check. And there's a lot of different events occurring all over the world that the students can follow and or they can access some of the news and the events to find out the health of the reef, the coral reefs that we have all over the world. We also have Project AWARE and this is a site that is dedicated to information about sharks and marine debris. So they have a huge sex a section called the Resource Zone. And in this section, there's a lot of information about how we can protect sharks, even if we're not living by the ocean. So those were two specific websites I wanted to introduce to you. And finally, we have a website for a dive shop. The reason that I put this on is we do have some participants who are located near the ocean or the sea. And they may have access to dive shops. So one thing that dive shops can do, even if you're two hours away from the nearest dive shop, they can frequently come to find you in your classroom. But one thing they do is they will send one of the divers in to give a presentation in English to the students. So this is a wonderful opportunity for the students to meet real divers, to see real pictures, and to um, experience a very different class in English. One, um, one of the, the gecko dive, which is this dive site, one of the activities that they did is in Indonesia, they actually came in and visited a class. You can see all the students sitting there and organized a beach cleanup. So they had students from many different locations come and do a beach cleanup and an underwater cleanup. So obviously the divers did the underwater part, but the beach cleanup was enjoyed by all of the students. So I hope this gave you some ideas for things that you can do for um, the class. And I'm going to turn it over to Kevin with more amazing facts and interesting ideas. Thanks a lot, Eve. Great idea, I think, about bringing guests into the classroom. No matter where you live, there are some environmental organizations. They may be in the government. They may be independent of the government. But they love to talk to students. Invite them to your class. Even if they speak in the native language, well, you can create a discussion afterwards in English, giving them scaffolding and the important terms in English. So thanks a lot for those great ideas, Eve. Strange Weather Part 3. Now, 
in the beginning, I gave you an overview. What is climate change? That was kind of a top-down approach where we get the whole picture. What I'd like to do now is give you sort of bottom-up activities. Um, that is, you don't have to tell students about the whole idea of climate change, but just give them awareness activities about ecology and the environment. Eve already talked about plastic. There's so many cool and useful things made out of plastic. You can see some here. But let's increase our students' awareness about how much plastic is around them. Here's a super easy activity, no preparation needed. Put students in groups and give them five minutes to make a list of as many things as possible that are made of plastic in their classroom. If they look carefully, they could write forever. There is just so much plastic. And then follow up with this question, what happens to plastic? Where does it go? They'll need time to think about it. It's, it's a difficult question, to tell you the truth. Because as Eve showed in her section of the webinar, plastic can make its way into sewers, into rivers, and into the ocean. Here's probably a new word for you. It's called the gyre. The ocean is full of different currents that circle, not all in the same direction, but they circle constantly. So a piece of trash can end up on a beach where no one has ever stood before. Imagine that. Yes, Yanin Valdez, gyre. This is the word for those currents in the ocean. I know you teachers love to, new, to, to learn new words. I'm going to have another one for you, too. So when your students thought about it, did they ever think that the answer to the question, where plastic goes, would be into the mouth of a turtle? Well, turtles love jellyfish, also called medusa in many languages. This turtle thinks he's eating a jellyfish. He's actually eating a piece of a plastic bag. And it's significant that this is a piece because plastic does deteriorate. It can deteriorate into smaller pieces. Or, what are these? If any of you have taken my test that I put on the Ning, it's only eight questions, but if you haven't taken it, you'll learn a lot. These are tiny, tiny little pieces of plastic that are used in the manufacturing of plastic items. They're melted down into plastics. But sometimes they fall off ships, and they end up in the ocean. And these are called nurdles. Ha, huh, a new word for you, huh? These tiny pieces of plastic are too small to be picked up. So they just float in the ocean or stay in the soil of the earth. Here's a picture from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Our plastic trash drifts in the gyre. There's that word again. So the plastic breaks down and becomes small, tiny, tiny pieces. Sometimes these are called mermaid's tears. And because they're bright colored pieces floating in the ocean, fish, turtles, sharks eat them. When fish are cut open, they often find pieces of plastic inside their stomachs. Does that mean that we're eating plastic too? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever the consequences, they cannot be good 
Microplastic. Thank you, Zayed from Jordan. Mm -hmm. The consequences cannot be good for the oceans. So to help this poor tur turtle, Let's please refuse the plastic bags that everyone tries to give us at stores, shops. Sometimes they force us to take them. But let's refuse the bag and bring our own. Let's listen to a loop song. And then again, think about how would you use this in your classroom? Refuse the bag. When you go to the store, refuse the bag, bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, refuse the bag, bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, you go to the store refuse the bag, bag. Bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, you go to the store refuse the bag, Bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, refuse the bag, bring your own, recycle, reuse. So how could you play that song in your classroom? It's so short, you've got to have time to fit it in. What would you make students do? It's important to have an activity. OK, here we go. Elizabeth Ecuador. Students could create their own chant. Uh-huh. OK. Students could mime. Ah, uh, yeah. Galena, when, when you go to the store, refuse the bag. Yeah, you could mime that, I think. Mm-hmm. OK. OK, you could act it out. Yeah. There again, Pedro from Mexico, you could fill in the blanks. Uh -huh. You could have students write the chant. You could have students repeat the chant. You could make a drawing about it or make a poster. We earlier saw posters. OK, good ideas, folks. Here's another easy activity for learning new vocabulary, new items of language. Picture cards. We use this in Jordan near the Red Sea to familiarize young people with the wonderful wildlife that was living in the Red Sea. There's so many things you can do with picture cards. You can use them as flashcards, but much more than that. For example, if you put them on the table and you have a group around the table of four, maybe five, you can call out starfish. And the first student to slap his or her hand on that starfish gets to keep that card. The student with the most cards is the winner. On the Ming, we have directions for making cards like this and about 10 different games that you can use with them. Really fun and great way to introduce new vocabulary to students. Here's a poster we made because people have been mentioning um, chance. And this is one that introduces students or reinforces the idea for students in just collecting litter. So we use this melody from a famous American song, which goes, if you know the song, um, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world 
in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Well, look at this. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Now at this point, students can add their own lyrics. So you've got a pattern there, right? Three lines and then a fourth different line. Now we ask students to supply their own words. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Yeah, now it's your turn. Can you think of something to put in these blanks? You can use any word. Smelly sandwich from Bertha. Oh yeah, there's a smelly sandwich in the garbage can. There's a smelly sandwich in the garbage can. There's a smelly sandwich in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Okay, what else? Um, there's a milk carton. Thank you, Svetlana. Let's change it. There's a milk carton in the garbage can. There's a milk carton in the garbage can. There's a milk carton in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Good. Anything else? There's an old bag. There's a recyclable item in the garbage can. There's a recyclable item in the garbage can. There's a recyclable item in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Wow. That's good tongue training, even difficult for me. Now, you don't need an instrument, right? You can do this as a chant. For example, there's an old battery in the garbage can. There's an old battery in the garbage can. There's an old battery in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. And we can further adjust the pattern to change more of the words. Here's a new pattern. There's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. We've got to do something about that. Oh, yeah. OK, so chance we can adjust and get student input. It's really easy. And again, we're introducing the, these ideas of ecology and environment in the classroom without giving students the big picture. So these are things that we can do once a week, right, to remind students of this topic. Creating posters. Eve showed you this poster already. This is a great thing. Give students some colored markers and ask them to do a poster about some environmental issue. This is about coral. Here's one about reducing and recycling. Another one about recycling. And my favorite activity to use with texts, and it could be posters that students make, it can also be newspaper articles for higher level students, is to tape them onto the walls, even outside. So you have five, six texts on the walls, and students need to run to them. Here's the instructions for this activity, which is available on the Ning. Students keep a paper with the questions on one desk, and then they run around to find the answer answers. Here's a sample question you could write. Name something that can damage coral. So students would run around the room. They'd say, they'd say, hmm. Read, they want the poster in the middle, the one about coral, and they would look for the answer there. When they find it, they run back to their headquarters and write the answer. Great way to make students read and have fun in reading. 
Or we can use songs from American English. We're going to listen to a little bit of the song about a local war. Listen to the song and think if you can uh, uh, tell me what a local war is. And we're playing the song. I want to be a local for I want to walk to the store And play my banjo on the porch As the sun goes down I want to live with the land I want to have garden and the lilies twinkling all through the night I want to be treading light I know Yeah, so we're getting a lot of questions. What is a local war? Well, Galena gave us a clue. A war is someone who eats something. A carnivore eats meat. An omnivore eats everything. A local vor eats locally produced food, right? This is a song from American Rhythms, our newest CD of cool music, which, as moderator Heather shows us, you can find at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. There are lots of songs there for local war. You want to click on local war, and then you'll see where the red circle is that there's a text. And this has tons of classroom activities for you to use the song in the classroom. And then the audio, which you can download for free. Here's an idea of some of the activities. You'll see the lyrics to the song. You'll find an activity menu. Each of those is a separate activity. That is, by my count, 12 activities to use with one song. Is American English great or what? There are language activities like this one, where you cut sentences um, and give them to students, and then they rearrange the words. There are activities to generate interest in the song. This one has movement. And again, you can find this in the activities online. There are pictures that you can cut up. Students in groups can manipulate the pictures to put them in the proper order. So what does a local war have to do with climate change? Well, again, here's our bottom-up approach. Do the song about local war and then ask students. Well, when you eat something locally, it doesn't take much energy to move it from the place where it was grown to your mouth. But if you buy something that was produced across the world, it involved trucks moving it to a ship. Trucks caused more carbon footprint. The ship caused more emissions. And then it was loaded to another truck. So you can see so much energy is going into moving food a long distance that when you eat locally, your carbon footprint is much lower, smaller. And guess what? We have all sorts of environmental activities on American English. Earth Day content spotlight. This will give you activities as well. This is a special day, April 22, in which we appreciate the Earth that we live on. And don't worry, 
Heather has kindly put all of these on the Ning for you, and you can access them, the links there. We have Content Spotlight Summer Camp, which is brand new. What does summer camp have to do with climate change? Well, we have a lot of activities, including environmental conversation jazz chants. Two of the audios that you heard today are available there, again, for free, and other great activities. There's also World's, World Oceans Day at American English. More activities. So now, I hope that tomorrow you'll think, what did you do to save the world today? Many of you had some great ideas to save the world. I hope that tomorrow you'll have more. And I hope that you'll have the means to provide your students with more ideas. Little activities will create awareness in students. It's the young people that really matter here. And here's a picture of me picking up trash at the Red Sea, showing people that it's fun. And you know what? In April, I drove across the United States. Now, driving a car a long way is not good for my carbon footprint, right? Because my car exhausts are contributing pollution. But on the way, my father and my wife and I, we decided we would pick up 1,000 pieces of trash. So whenever we stopped, we picked up trash. And we ended up with 1,000 pieces of trash. It's fun to pick up trash. And if we teach this to our students, maybe we can get them interested in being active. Look at this, an anti-littering campaign in Jordan on Facebook. That is great taking it into their own hands. The world is a beautiful place now. Look at that clear blue water. Now that's actually in an aquarium, but we want to keep the planet clean and cleaner than it is now. Remember, we have American English at Facebook, too. And we'd like you to like us there, if you have Facebook. For all of you who are in viewing sessions, many people will watch the webinar in groups. I'd like you just to shout out, yay, right now. If you're in a viewing session, shout out, yay. OK, wait, I hear, I hear Mexico. I think I hear Brazil, I think I hear Russia. Yeah, OK, I hear a lot of people in viewing sessions. Thank you so much for listening to our webinar called Strange Weather, Strange Weather, Strange Weather. Climate Change Activities for the English Classroom. Thank you, Eve Smith in Georgia for your fantastic ideas. Thank you, moderators, Heather, Jenny, and the nearly invisible Curtis for making this great. But most of all, thank you, participants, and thank you for spreading the word about the environment. See you at the next webinar. I'm going to go to Eve Smith right now to let her say goodbye to you. Thanks so much, Kevin. It was a pleasure to be able to be with you all today. I was absolutely inspired by the wonderful discussion you had going in the chat box and how much this topic means to all of us. So in addition to the graffiti by my house asking, what can I do to save the world today, I think that 
the inspiration I got from you gave me a lot of answers to that question. So I hope that you all have a wonderful day or evening and um, keep inspiring. Thanks, Eve. We do have awesome teachers here. I gotta say that. Thank you, everybody. Over to you, moderator Heather. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kevin and Eve. Uh, to all our viewers out there, please join me in giving Kevin and Eve a big round of applause for providing us with all of these great ideas for bringing this important global issue into our classroom in a language-focused way.